Welcome to Super Entrepreneurs Podcast. Today we have with us Rob Catalano. How are you, Rob? Good, good. And yourself? I'm doing amazing, my friend. Thank you so much uh, for coming on the third time. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Thanks for having me. Come back and forth too, if you'd like. I know. I had some major internet issues, but I'm glad to connect this time. I like your background. You never probably don't feel, you know, claustrophobic there. Yeah, no, it's good. And you, you caught us on a, a cloudy, cloudy day. Usually it's a lot sunnier, which is actually probably better to be able to see, but um, a cloudy day versus sun blaring in my eye. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, downtown Toronto. So don't get worried if you see cranes flying by me. It's one of those things. Oh, yeah. You're in Toronto, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah so yeah, I'm in Whitby. So it's same for me as well. It's really dark, but it's beautiful. I like it. I like any kind of any kind of experience, right? <laughs> yeah. So can good. you tell us tell us more about what you do in your own words? Yeah. So um, I found myself, I guess, in the last 16, 17 years in the world of HR technology, um, and uh, and basically in a couple of companies. And the most latest one is a company that was co-founded about five, six years ago called Work Tango, and it's really meant to help organizations understand the sentiment of their employees get feedback in an easy way to build a better workplace experience. Um, so, you know, again, on my shirt, you probably see improving work lives. Um, mm -hmm. We don't have a, a mission statement because we believe missions end. We have a passion statement, which is to improve lives at work. And work is in parentheses because for better or worse, we spend a lot of our waking time there. So a lot of our driving force is if we can help companies understand employee sentiment, learn what's on their mind uh, in a much more robust and quicker way, leveraging technology than it's been done in the past. For example, let's do an annual engagement survey. It takes three months to get the data, another month to get it into the leader's hands, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Companies were doing these things, but it wasn't fast, quick, and agile to help companies build better experiences. So uh, our, our company is meant to help companies do that um, in a much more easier, fast, and agile way. So could you give us an example of what that looks like um, for a small business, for example? Yeah. So, you know, I think when any business, small, large, but even if you're small, um, understanding what's working for employees or measuring something like engagement or sentiment around a certain item uh, is, is really important. So let's take an you know, example of a couple of our small customers. They are entering into 2020, for example, 2021 with a lot of changes in their world, remote work. Um, trying to get more feedback in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and also trying to you know measure and monitor engagement of employees in these uncertain and robust times. So what our technology do was uh, effectively like kind of simple, quick pulse surveys is ask employees how they're feeling, get their thoughts on certain items, measure things like engagement or diversity sentiment, but also just get feedback on what's happening in the company. You know, we're rolling something out. What's your feedback? Or we just did something and we rolled something out at our company. You know, are people liking it or not? Mm -hmm. um, but what it's doing is um, our system will allow that data to come in a confidential but aggregated way to get a real understanding of oh, how okay. employees are thinking and feeling about what's happening at work. And in different ways, quantitatively, people will be able to measure levels of engagement. They'll be able to see trends on how employees are feeling to gauge you know, a sentiment of whatever they're measuring, uh, but even get, you know, open-ended feedback, ways to look at, you know, sentiments or themes of reading, you know, hundreds of comments, which might be a little more challenging. But the idea is, uh, you know, an example is customers would do those types of surveys, get that feedback in real time. Uh, and many of them will serve them, not just to, you know, an HR leader or, uh, you know, or one executive like a CEO, uh, they'll actually put it into other leaders' hands. And those leaders have access to this data because they have a huge effect on engagement and performance of their team. So, you know, it, the way our platform is built, it's very uh, configurable where people leverage it for many different reasons. But those are just some examples I thought would be helpful in today's times. Mm -hmm. So when they input information like employees, do they have like a dashboard or you, you integrate it into their own website? Yeah, so the way it works is that um, we actually upload employee data from from our customers into WorkTango, so through their HR systems or mm -hmm. HRIS systems. And what that allows us to do is actually send out, whether it's unique links to their email or their mobile phone or get them to scan QR codes if people aren't in an online world, for example, or sitting in front of a desk every day. And they go to a WorkTango page where they're providing that feedback and, and insight. Mm -hmm. What then happens is at the administrative level, in real time, that's when executives, HR folks, leaders, whoever you choose to see that information can start seeing dashboards to highlight 
what's working, what isn't, what mm-hmm. the results and impact are saying, and, mm-hmm. and a system aggregating and giving those dashboards in a, in a real-time way as opposed to someone manually doing Excel magic to figure it out. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of how kind of the platform works in terms of getting the insights. And then there's other elements of what we do with that data to try to help companies with. But okay. uh, to answer your question, that's kind of how, how it works. Mm-hmm. So is there a component um, of when you talk about engagement, uh, do you guys have any kind of a, a, a point system or anything kind of, you know, the, the, the happier you are, you get a badge or something like nothing, any, anything like that into the, into the program? No, when we, I, you know, my past life was actually building a, it was a company that started in Toronto. I was there for 10, 11 years called Achievers, which did you know, rewards and recognition technology. Okay. It was really focused on that. Yeah. Um, however, at WorkTango, um, typically, I'd say 95% of the time, the feedback we get is confidential. Okay. So we're not tying that, that information to one individual, uh, you know, um, employee, however, mm-hmm. however, you know, at a company level, you can then start seeing engagement levels by, every department, every leader, every country, however that a company wants to slice that up and, and get that in real time. So mm-hmm. there isn't really an individual award or anything like that, but mm-hmm. there is an understanding of where sentiment is going really well and trying to replicate those or, or recognize those, but where there might mm-hmm. be smoke before fire to deal with them, uh, you know, in a more immediate way than waiting another year to the next, you know, engagement survey, for example. Mm-hmm. So, um, not sure if you want to answer this or if you're allowed to answer this. Um, what, how has it been um, on the gauge for basically like overall happiness um, during the pandemic um, on average for corporations or companies? Yeah. So I actually just, I do a number of talks on just the concept of engaging employees through uncertain times. And, and mm-hmm. what's interesting, I showed this one slide that has three weeks or multiple weeks before the pandemic a year ago and showing how we measure engagement internally at WorkTango. And we had a hundred percent positive, you know, uh, engagement levels. Cause every week we ask people how they're feeling about work and, and those type of questions. However, once it became March 12th, 2020, yeah. we started seeing there being for the first time, more negative sentiment. And, and the reality is, is that has never got, and it's been a year later and we've never got back to that hundred percent. And I think this, this world of work and everything around it is impacting people's happiness. And I showed that example to kind of share as a business leader, this, this has impact on employees, but when we actually take all of our employee or excuse me, our customer data, look at all those benchmarks, we're seeing a pretty significant draw 20 to 30% from Q1 last year to Q1 this year, when it comes to uh, overall sentiment, when it comes to engagement of employees. Uh, and I think it's a factor of, again, uh, it's change, it's uncertainty. There's, you know, trying to figure out ways to do new things or getting employees to do more with less with many people that, you know, organizations that had to scale back. Uh, so it definitely is having an impact um, on, you know, on employees. Mm-hmm. How about the work from home component? Do you guys measure that? Like how they must be very happy about that. Well, it's, it, it's kind of a mixed bag, right? You know, mm-hmm. what's interesting is work tango in itself. Like we doubled headcount last year. We grew in, in larger ways we've ever had before because this world of remote mm-hmm. work, it's getting harder for companies to understand sentiment around mm-hmm. how employees are thinking, feeling, um, you know, enabling leaders to get that insight as well. You can't just walk around or see people in the office and have those quick, you know, water cooler conversations to understand yeah. what people are feeling. So from, from our perspective, you know, it's, 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 provided value to those types of companies to understand, but you know, the feedback is mixed, right? Some people it's, it's really hard to work in a home environment. It's like, I don't have children. I don't know what it's like to have to, you know, feed them and, and take them to school and or mm-hmm. homeschool them. But a lot of employees are in that position where it's now a balancing and juggling act in ways they couldn't have before. So I think it's mixed sentiments. Uh, this is, it brings a lot of uncertainty. Some people may like it. Some people just mm-hmm. want to get back in the office, right? Um, yeah, that's true. Yeah. From what I'm, what I'm seeing is that there's a mixed group, right? Like you said, there's certain people that are, uh, they love the fact that they're home in their own comfort and they produce so much more Then there's others that are juggling, you know, the kids at work, right. They're producing less. And then there's some people that love that water cooler or going down to getting a coffee together. Um, that five minutes or 10 minutes of social interaction with their friends or who they know at work, was a pretty big component in their productivity as well, like emotionally, right? 
Yeah. And, and to your question, you know, <laughs> companies, we've been helping them, let's say a year ago, understand, well, what employees feel about remote work? Do they have the resources? What does that look and feel like? But today we're doing a little more of, well, what's back to work? Do people have a comfort level traveling when it comes to you know, to and from work or being in an office with other folks or traveling for their job? Um, or, or maybe they can't, maybe they don't have daycares that are open to allow their children to stay. So yeah. it's giving companies an understanding of, well, what's on the mind of employees before we start deploying new policies or new changes? And, and that, that, that's, I guess, a big crux of what we do. How do you understand the pulse uh, and sentiment of employees, not just to measure things like engagement, but from an agility perspective, you know, how do you understand what's happening to, to yield better decisions from a people perspective? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like I, for me, like uh, I was very much interested to interview you, Rob, because what you do is your, your, your data and that collection in the business, in the corporate world is, you know, is adding a layer of comfort to people that work um, in that environment. If, you know, if you've seen any of my previous work and online stuff, I'm very, I'm very pro self-employment. You know, I don't want people working in jobs, but if they, if they are, you're providing that um, awareness to the people that are in charge to make their life better in some way. Right. Yeah. And, and, and it might be worth even bringing up now is that typically when companies go through this process, right, whether it's, you know, an engagement survey or some way to understand sentiment, mm -hmm. that day they usually lives in, you know, again, with executives or HR. And one of the major value adds, and I think what helps build this better employee experience at work, because again, a lot of us are spending time there, mm -hmm. is not only will we serve the data or companies have the, you know, the ability to serve the data to an individual leader to just see their dashboard just for their team mm -hmm. or their department or their region. Mm -hmm. But what the system will also do is start recommending learnings and actions to those individual leaders for their respective scores or whatever they're measured on. So if I had really poor scores and recognition of employees, I would get different nudges and support as a leader than someone else. And the reason why that's so important is that a company can't have a one size fits all solution to fix engagement. It's different for different teams and leaders. And that ability to start leveraging technology to share those insights has become quite valuable um, to make employees' lives better at the end of the day, yeah. um, to your point. Yeah. What was the, what's the biggest challenge you faced in the past and, and you know, how did you overcome it? Yeah. So uh, regarding kind of work tango or just yeah, <laughs> like overall in life, you know, an entrepreneurship journey. Yeah. So it's interesting, right? We, our last company, we, you know, again, small started growing and then ended up over, you know, a relatively short period of time raising over $60 million in capital. And that allows you to move fast. Um, and, and it comes with changes, right? It comes with new leadership and board members and all the things that have to happen when it comes to being accountable to venture capitalists, et cetera. Um, and Worktango, you know, we've managed to, to I call be customer funded uh, in the last five or six years. And then it's a little more challenging. It's hard to accelerate and grow when you're you know, you're not having $60 million or, or someone else's funding that's there, uh, but it comes with pros and cons as well, right? We, we were able to run the business as we'd like. So I think the biggest challenge has been, you know, the discussions and decisions around infusing capital, what that would look and feel like, um, especially in our world where the world of HR technology is blowing up for lack of a better term. There's so much investment and growth and mm -hmm. levels of investment and acquisition, like can I, you know, all over the place. Cause now people are realizing all the technology we had for our customers and our prospects and our marketing folks, like we need that for employees as well. There's, 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 you know, an importance there. So I think that's big. The, the biggest challenge is, you know, how do you fund a business differently than maybe what you're used to? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we always like to ask our guests what their inner superpower is that got them to this point. Yeah. Uh, I honestly think it's just, it's kind of relentlessness. It's the ability to, you know, uh, work hard through unknowns. Um, you know, yeah. again, when you're, I've been in startup organizations for, oh my gosh, 23 years um, where companies that all the ones I've started at were less than four or five employees. And I think when you don't, when you don't have a clear path, so there's not process. Um, I think it's a matter of just, you know, moving forward and just being relentless and continuing 
to move forward if they're naysayers or other things. So I think that's uh, that's what I call a superpower because you know yeah. when you kind of build a business and uh, can do it against all odds, which is typically you know starting a company, not many succeed. Yeah. Uh, I think that's been really great to see kind of three of them in my in my past kind of get to you know I guess you know, definitions of success. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Um, we always also like to ask what your, you know, morning routine looks like. Do you have a ritual of some sort? Like, do you have a morning kind of routine? Yeah, it's, it's pretty consistent, to be honest. Yeah. Um, usually it's uh, it's up, you know, uh, I'd say anytime between like 5.30 and 6.30, I will mm -hmm. watch sports, <laughs> sports center, kind of get caught up from that perspective. Yeah. Uh, I'll usually uh, keep an hour for some level of workout, whether that's, you know, the bike, yoga, some level Something. of meditation, whatever it is, um, mm -hmm. you know, make sure, you know, don't miss a day from that perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the next part is really just, you know, getting prepared for the day. And what I mean by that is getting through emails, all the things that I have, you know, have commitments to provide my employees, customers. And I try and leave my day a little more open to navigate and support people on my team. Right. Mm -hmm. um, now, and, and also meetings get the best of you. So mm -hmm. uh, the morning is usually those three prongs, sports, mm -hmm. something personal cool. in terms of, you know, uh, yeah. of health and wellness, and then, yeah. you know, kind of get prepared for the day. Yeah, that's good. It's mind body, right? That's good. Yeah. And yeah. a couple of coffees. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Right. <laughs> so that's awesome. What about, um, uh, for your company, what are you, what are you thinking where you want to take this? Like right now is, is it, is it only in Canada or is it global or how, how does it work? Yes. Yeah. So we, it started in Toronto, but, um, our, our employees are in, Denmark, Brazil, India, Canada, US, um, kind of all over. And then our customers, uh, we operate about 40 different uh, languages or oh, cool. you know, leaders in our platform are in 100 different countries. Great. So, uh, you know, it's predominantly North America, obviously being where we are. But, um, you know, we actually, we just also hired a head of the UK to help build out EMEA. But, um, you know, for the most, most employees based are in Toronto and Ottawa, however, uh, it is operated and it was built to be more enterprise and help companies that have the different languages and complexities as, as well. Mm -hmm. And where, where do you, where do you think, where do you want to, where do you want this company to go? Like how, how big? Yeah, it's, it's interesting, right? I, I, even though I'm in Toronto now, I did spend a bit of time in like four or five years in, in San Francisco and the UK, nice. especially when I was in San Francisco, a lot of people, you know, what's the exit strategy? Where are you yeah. going? And and to be honest, like we want to build a company that had valuable and health and, and happy customers. Right. And, and that's always the way we've approached this. Um, you know, that's probably why, you know, we haven't taken funding right now. It's just a lot of people are more interested in, in once you get funding, then you have to make decisions based on, you know, making the dollars. It's not just about the customer experience and yeah. we're really focused on that. So for me, I think growth happens in three ways, right? We're going to continue to grow like, mm -hmm. you know, revenues and profits and all that is, you know, going to be up into the right and, and aggressive goals. So I think that'll, if we do that, great things will happen. Um, second is innovate our product. So there's growth in the different ways we hear employee sentiment. We provide that whether it's the data or the predictive analytics side of things, or, you know, try to leverage data in a better way. And the third is, you know, how do we build better actions? How do we support behavior change? Mm -hmm. um, but the reality is that those two don't happen unless you get the most important thing, which is bring on great passionate talent. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's the, the next definition of growth is, you know, mm -hmm. we're actively hiring, bringing on people that are passionate about our passion statement that, you know, are tied more to a job than what we're, what we're setting out to do. And, and to be honest, like if we do those three things, we will see growth. Um, so, you know, I, I guess another way to, to, to say that is there's not this number and evaluation mm -hmm. or an exit or anything like that. It's, you know, we're going to, but, but this isn't going to be lifestyle. Like we're okay. We just want to be 35 employees or anything like that. Like we do want to grow and provide more value and we'll just continue to do it. Um, you know, I don't know what the future will hold. Maybe, maybe we will infuse funding. Maybe we won't, but uh, growth is always on the mindset for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's great. And you know, you made a good point about the customer experience, whoever I interview and I talk to and being in this, you know, in business, I find the ones that are focused on the people, on the customers, like the customers and employees and people like human, like they're not the numbers, the ones that are focused on that, they see tremendous growth. 
And I think, I think it's just nature, right? Like when you're doing that, amazing things start happening because your focus on is on the right, right component of business. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, a lot of companies have the, the credo, you know, everyone's in sales and, you yeah. know, and, and at work tango, we say everyone's in customer support, right? Mm. We, you know, our net promoter score has been you know, over 80 for the last four years combined, which mm-hmm. is kind of unheard of in, in B2B SaaS and, or even HR tech. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it does yield success. And there's a lot of data out there that shows for SaaS companies, especially B2B, that, that it's an important element of a growth mm-hmm. company, especially at a, a smaller stage. Um, and, and, you know, it's something we're, we're not shy to talk about, like extremely sure. proud. You can go to all the the Capterra's G2, the public review sites, mm-hmm. we're Tango unmatched, right? We're, we're up against companies that are over billion dollars of valuation and no one's matching the support scores that we provide our customers. Amazing. And and it's just, you know, and if we do like, to your other question, if we continue to do those things and focus on the customer, we will be successful and yeah. continue to be. It's um, just, that's how it works. Great. All right, Rob, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I'm, I'm so happy that you took the time to come on the show um, hopefully this gives some kind of aha moment to someone out there that can, you know, in the audience that, that can kind of take that leap into the entrepreneurship world and you're doing great stuff and I wish you all the success and all the best. Yeah, and no, I appreciate having me. Um, you know, thanks for kind of waving the flag and sharing the, the entrepreneur no stories out there. And yeah. it's, you know, we, we all, uh, we joke. It's like standing on the shoulder of giants. Like people have figured stuff out. They've learned things. If we yeah. can, you know, get insight to those learnings, yes. that's great. Yeah. And yeah. you give people a platform to do that. So thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah.